right, so we got to have a couple kingdom keywords before we get into it this morning. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. God, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your son, Lord God. I thank you for the opportunity to share this morning from the word. I thank you, God, that we've already read, and so we're just going to dig deeply and pull out a few things to help us understand even better what you've called, created, and designed us to do. God, I'm excited that you allow me to be a part of this work. And Lord God, use me mightily this morning to present with clarity, with precision, with power, the accurate word of Jesus Christ, that we will be changed, that we will become who you created and called us to be. And Lord God, that we will be about the business of advancing your kingdom work. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So kingdom keywords we do every week. A couple key words, words that you need to understand in order to understand the message, right? Sometimes we read stuff and we don't know the word and we just gloss over it. And when you gloss over words, often you miss the purpose, the intent of what the word was saying. And so this morning, first one is flesh or, you know, church, the flush, right? Our human bodies, but also means a human point of view. When we say it's a perspective, people out POV, the point of view. So the point of view of a human versus the point of view of the Lord. And then finally, human nature and its vulnerability to sin, our flesh. The next word is the spirit, the Holy Spirit, and generally speaking about his power. And so those two key words, in addition to the ones we looked at last week, we talked about, uh, what was it, justification. We talked about grace. We talked about righteousness. But these two words are critical for this week's understanding. So the kingdom concept, the sermon in a sentence, the one idea is the same as last week. The good news is that through King Jesus, God saves sinners like you and me. Through the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, through what Jesus did on the cross when he gave his life in exchange for yours and mine, sinners can be saved. And none of us is uh, absent. None of us is not represented. We read last week, Romans chapter 3, verses, verse 23 said, what all have sinned, everybody, all of us. So none of us can feel better, act better, think that we are better than anybody else because we are all sinners in need of a savior. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation. We were, the word salvation means rescue, right? When you, I was, I was, I think I told you this story many times, I was scuba diving. Why? I can't swim. I was in the ocean scuba diving and can't swim. You know what I mean? But I had the little floaty thing on, and I thought that the floaty thing mattered. But when you suck in that water, it don't matter the floaty or not. You lose your mind, especially when you know you can't swim. Come on, somebody. And I saw the little, they were all kind of fish. They were beautiful and all that. But once I took in that salt water, that was that. Fortunately, my wife can swim. And so I reached out for her, honey. I grabbed her with love and affection. Literally saved my life, rescued me. Uh-huh. What is going on here? rescued because I was on my way down as they say going for the third time it was only the first time but that was enough amen just a little bit of advice you can't swim stay out the ocean amen, amen. some wisdom for you that's for free all right salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles so the message came to Jews first and then their opportunity was to spare the good news through Jesus Christ uh, of the good news of salvation then to those of us who would be considered Gentile so we did the first three points last week this week our new spirit-led lives, so what we get, when, what we receive when uh, Jesus, through Christ, our new spirit-led lives because of Jesus Christ. So the first thing is we have a new mindset. We have a new way of thinking. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 8. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So God sent his son, Jesus put on a flesh suit. He became a human being, came to the earth as an offering to pay the price for our sins. We should be excited about it. Any sinners in the house? Ex-sinners, former sinners? Okay, thank you. All right, just check it. So Jesus came and paid the price for your sins, right? So just like we have school loans and credit card bills and all that, you realize somebody came and paid the price for that, for your craziness? Amen? Amen. We talked about how, you know, you, you have a file, you have a jacket, you have a, a, a the criminal case against you, and they look and the file is in. No, even better, the file is gone. There is no file they put in your last name. Boom, no file. Are you kidding me? Your stuff is expunged. You can say if they ask you, are you sinner? Are you on your way to hell? No, absolutely not. 
I don't even have a file anymore. Right? That's what happened when you get your stuff expunged. And so Jesus came and expunged our records. That's powerful. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in our physical bodies, in our behaving. And in order that the righteous, righteous means in right relationship with God, has to be, a dealt, with, has to be dealt with. Righteous requirement of the law might fully be met in us. So the point is, the bill, the law has, the bill has to be paid. We saw the Supreme Court said to the president, like, nah, bro, you can't forgive all them school loans. Amen. We're not doing that. The loans have to be paid back. And so the religious requirement of the law might be fully met in us. So it means it's taken care of. It's just somebody did in our stead who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we no longer live according to the desires of our nature. Because in our own nature, we're a mess. Amen. 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 Some of us are messy messes. Amen. In our own nature. But God. Verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on what the flesh desires. So for people who live according to their human nature, their priorities, their aspirations, and desires are what their flesh wants. Amen? Amen? I want money. I want sex. I want power. I want whatever. I want my way. If we live according to the flesh, we will pursue the things that the flesh wants. Isn't that true? But, big word, but those who live according to the spirit have a different mindset. It says they have their mindset on what the spirit desires. So there's two sets of desires. There's two mindsets. What the spirit wants, what the flesh wants. And, and we read in chapter 6 and 7 how Paul is wrestling with what the spirit wants, what the flesh wants. And at some point in our lives, we were all there. But now, we'll talk about today, because of the Holy Spirit, our mindset can be reset and focus and desire the things that the Spirit wants. And so our mindset is on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by, the mind controlled by, the mind under the influence of the flesh is death. If we follow our own desires, we follow life according to the way most of us want to live it, that will undoubtedly bring us death. But, now the big three-letter word, but the mind governed by the spirit is both life and peace. Don't people want life and peace? Amen. Right? I mean, that's, men, that's what we say we want more than anything. I just want some peace. Amen? You want peace. And so what we want most in life is only found not in pursuing what our flesh, is, our flesh, is, our flesh wants, but in what the spirit wants for us. And pursuing and having the mindset, our mindset on the things of the spirit is both life and peace. Verse 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. So when we are under the flesh, when we are living life what we want, it is an actually in conflict with God. So we can't just rest in like, well, that's just the way I am. No. You mean anybody ever just settling, well, that's just who I am? No. That's unacceptable. If yourself is crazy, you have to like, no, we can't do that because that is the mind controlled by the flesh. But if we want the things that the spirit wants and we surrender our lives to the leading and the guiding of the spirit, we want what the spirit wants for us is life and peace. And so if we're governed by the flesh, we're hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it. People who are surrendered to their flesh can only do what they want, their flesh wants them to do. But those of us who are in the realm of the flesh, we cannot please God. And so if we want to please God, we have to be surrendered. We have to seek and allow the spirit to guide us. And it's important we understand there's, only, there's two diametrically opposed directions. Let me see. Give me an example. Okay. So I say Disney. Where's Disney? See, all, all the East Coasters are like Florida, right? You travel a little bit, there's Disney California. Disneyland and Disney World, Right? Disney Europe. That, well, see, you travel more than that. So. For the fancy people, there's Disney Europe. See what I'm saying? For us Kennywood people, you know, I just found out there's Disneyland. But all right, cool. That's good. But the point is, you can't either go into Disney uh, Land or Disney World. Or if you're going to work, you got a conference. You got a conference in, in Los Angeles. You got a conference in New York. You can't go both places at the same time. Why? 
in opposite directions. They're totally different places. And so we can't be in this kind of, well, and so when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you are saying, I am picking a direction. And I am going to pursue life in the spirit. And so there was an interesting discussion this morning in Sunday school. We have these debates about people saved, not saved, whatever. The question is, have you selected the direction? You got to pick a direction. Now, when you're going, now, it doesn't mean that, like, which way am I going? I can go to Florida either way. Don't matter. Don't matter. Which one? Send me somewhere. Florida. I'm going to Disney World land. No, forget Florida. I'm going to L.A. or New York. I'll get myself confused. I'm either going to Los Angeles or New York. I want to go to New York. By definition, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I have to go what direction? Primarily east, a little bit north, right? We know that the, the odd number uh, highways go north-south, evens go east-west. So I'm going to New York. I'm going east. Now, does that mean that I won't make pit stops? Does that mean I won't even make detours? But my directionality is the issue. So when we become followers of Jesus Christ, we may not live perfectly, but we can't just be going back and forth. I'm going east. I'm going west. I'm going, what are we doing? It doesn't work like that. Amen. Right? And we, and we have these kind of discussions like, well, I, I, you, you shouldn't, sin shouldn't be your everyday story. Amen. And as believers, we want to make excuses. Well, everybody says, yeah, I get it. But on average, it would be okay to have a sin-free day. Amen. 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 And that doesn't have to be like that weird. You know what I mean? That should be like more or less the normal thing. Do we sin? Sure. But we just settle in like, well, everybody sins. I sin, you sin, it's all good. Come on now. Right? We should not be comfortable living in a state of separation from God, of active disobedience of God's instruction. Amen? And so it's not just like I'm always sinning. I, shouldn't be, I mean, even like, you know, if you got kids and nephews, nieces, it's like kids staying with you. Some days they act out, right? But some days they have good days, right? And so we should be, be careful about always just letting folk off the hook ourselves, off the hook like, well, everybody, no. Sin should be an aberration. If we realize that sin causes fracture between us and God, and sin both saddens and perhaps even angers God, <laughs> we, we should take that seriously. It should bother us. And we shouldn't just be like, yeah, well, I sin all the time. That's not a good thing. We should allow the spirit to change us. Amen? Amen. All right, so because why? We have a new mindset. We're going east or west, north or south. You can't go both directions at once. Second thing, we are free from the power of sin. This is why this is important. We are free from the power of sin. When we live a spirit-led life, verse 17 of chapter 6, thanks be to God that you used to be slaves to sin. You used to be saved, but now you are emancipated. Anybody in here have family members who are slaves? Enslaved? Anybody? Anybody? Got some folks? Okay. You have come to obey from the heart the pattern of teaching that has now been cla that has claimed your allegiance. He says that when you understand this stuff, you pursue the instruction, the teaching of the word of God. It's like you've been captivated by it. And then you have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. You've become enslaved to doing right. Being enslaved to doing what God wants done. That's why Paul calls himself. He says, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I'm owned by. And so the question is, are we captivated by the life of being a follower and a citizen of the kingdom of God? Or are we continuously enslaved by sin? Does our conduct, the way we act, the way we think, the way we speak, the way we treat people, does that look like we've changed masters? Or do we look just like we look, sound just like we sound, behave like we just behave, like we used to behave when we were enslaved to sin? There should be a difference. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We just celebrated Juneteenth, right? June 19th, 1865, formerly enslaved people in the state of Texas found out 
that they had been emancipated, freed. What in the world? So the Emancipation Proclamation signed and was supposed to go into effect on January 1st, 1863, right? What's 1865 minus 1863, <laughs> right? What? How can this be? It was not until the Union Army arrived in Texas to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation. And so for those people who were still there, they still behaved like, act like, thought like they were enslaved, even though technically they were free. And so the question for us as believers, are we still acting as if we are enslaved? Two years later, but when the power, come on somebody, when the power of the United States Army, the Union Army arrived, they were like, all right, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> all right, then. Right? And then, I mean, you read it, it's a whole other thing, right? And we want you to stay in place, but now you're a, you're a servant. No, no, you're an employee, right? And so even the language was you're supposed to stay on the, what was a plantation that now supposedly a farm, you're supposed to stay there and work as an employee. Now, if you had had someone enslaved for two and a half centuries, their family, and now all of a sudden they were technically free, how would your relationship with them change? It would not. You see what I'm saying? What my advice would be like, y'all got to get up out of here. <laughs> we must leave. We got to go, right? And so we have to get out of the circumstances, the situations, the way we were living, or else, even though the emancipation technically has happened, we can still walk and behave and think. This is why this mindset piece is so important. We can still think like people who are enslaved to the power of sin. And so it's critical to understand we are free from the power of sin. Do you realize we do not have to make sin an ongoing, everyday lifestyle piece? Anybody know why we sin? Why you sin? Somebody tell me why you sin. Fleshly desires. Put that in English for us non-spiritual people. Say, I want to sin. Just say it out loud. I sin because I want to. I like sin. Sin feels good, tastes good. I love some sin. Just say it, right? Just get it out there. You know, our fleshly desires overwhelm us. And... <laughs> I sin because I want to. <laughs> See, the clearer we are about it, the easier it is to deal with. Amen. See what I'm saying? We stop shading and up. Well, you know, I was overcome by the enemy. And, ah, oh, yeah, that might be true. But at the end of the day, we sin because we want to. But the beautiful part is, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't have to be Amen. under the influence and surrender and re-enslave ourselves. Can you imagine you left the plantation, you moved north, you got a job at General Motors making $5 a day, you doing it. And then you're like, you know, I miss the watermelon from Mississippi. <laughs> wow, dude. <laughs> okay, he enjoyed that one. Right? I, I, I miss the watermelon. I'm going to go here back to Mississippi. What are we doing here? What are we doing? I mean, it's funny, but guess what? It's the same thing when we sin. Amen. Like, really? You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about it in a minute. You're a child of the king. See, it's okay to say, you know what? Some stuff is beneath me. I know we don't want people to be like feeling some kind of way. You think you're better. Than yeah, I am. I'm better than that. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I'm a child of the king. I don't do that. I don't act like, I don't think that way. My mindset is changed. And I'm free from the power of sin. Number three, we have God's spirit living in us. We actually have the presence of Jesus Christ taking up residence in us. That's crazy. Verse eight, 
Verse 9 and 10 of Romans chapter 8. However, you are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So here's the metric. Here's the measure. If you don't have the spirit of God, you don't belong to him. Now, we can talk about, and we will, we'll talk about being filled with the Spirit and all of this stuff. But the fundamental piece is the Holy Spirit lives in us, takes up resonance, and it's the Holy Spirit that draws us, that even gives us a will to be saved. This has nothing to do with us, how smart we are. That's why when, you know, hear people do quote-unquote altar calls in life, you know, give, give God a chance. You know, give, give the Lord an opportunity. What are we talking about here? Like God is begging us. It's like he's the one that even prompts you, who gives you the ability, the desire to even want to have your sins forgiven. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Watch this, verse 10. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, because of sin, we are all going to die. Our grandparents, Adam and Eve, set into motion the death and destruction of the entire planet. But we read about how a new Adam has come. Jesus is the new Adam. And he's going to restore, ultimately, the, earth, the world back to its original intent, fully under the dominion of God. He says, but if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. Because we are in right relationship with God, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, and it positions us properly, it justifies us, removes the guilt of our sin and our shame. You remember when you surrendered your life to, to Christ and the weight that felt lifted? Maybe it was just me, but you just felt a weight was lifted. Amen. Like I'm free. Hallelujah. I'm clean. I'm pure. You know, it's like when you have a colonoscopy. I'm waiting for mine, you know what I'm saying? But people talk about, you know, you just feel all cleaned out. Like, I don't even want to eat nothing funny. What, I'm too real for y'all? <laughs> oh, y'all too young to have had colonoscopies. Okay, anyway. But you know what I mean? You're like, listen, I'm gonna I want to take better care of myself. I'm all cleaned out. Amen. Amen. We're adopted. God's adopted children. I love this one. And it's important that you understand kind of the, the cultural context here. We're adopted. Brother Steve talked about this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. We just described, we just learned uh, a minute ago, we were led by the Spirit. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. It frees you so that you will not, li so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought you out, brought your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. So this is all crazy. First of all, to go from slave to free is one thing. But to go from slave to son, to slave to daughter, that's unbelievable. Amen. Do you see the status change that happens like in one move? From slave to child. And so in the Roman culture in which this is being written, it was a big deal. So in order for you to be adopted, first of all, your biological father had to renounce you. So essentially, they had a, a kind of a, a ceremony. They would... Basically say, we're selling you, they would buy you back. Sell you, buy you back. Selling you. So the third time, they would release you, essentially, and not buy you back. You were then free. You were then fatherless. Then the person who wanted to buy you would go to the magistrate. They would have to get permission to buy you. And then they would purchase you, and then you would be their child. And the amazing part of this is you would now instantly become an heir. You know what it means to be an heir? So to go from I'm enslaved to an heir. So the plantation that your people grew up on, not only are you free, now you own it. Does that make sense? So when grandpa dies, and it gets a little, I don't want to get into all that slavery piece, it gets complicated. But when grandpa dies or former master dies, who might also be grandpa, you know how that works, you <laughs> literally become the owner of the plantation. That's huge. That's huge. And so he becomes heir. And then he says you become joint heirs, we'll see in a second, with Jesus Christ on the same level with him. Do we, I, mean, I don't know. I, want, 
I, I want to be clear about this. Mm. This should blow our minds. Thank you. This should blow our minds, our status, because of what Jesus did for us. Mm. Unbelievable. I'll give you an example. So, Claudius, the Caesar at that time, he wanted Nero, who was not related to him, to be his successor. So what he did was he adopted Nero as his son. He had a daughter, Octavia. Gets deeper. Nero wanted to marry Octavia. He could not legally. Why? Because that was his sister. And so they had to, you know, do what you want to do. Pass special le legislation to allow Nero to marry Octavia because when he was adopted by Claudius, he literally became Claudius' son. And then passed on the Roman Empire to Nero with his crazy self. <laughs> and so when we talk about adoption, this is what it means that you literally become the child of the creator of the universe. Wow. And so it really doesn't matter who your father, good, bad, or indifferent was in a biological sense. You become the child of God. Verse 16, the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Verse 17, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs get all the stuff. And because God, watch this, it's important. Because God will not die. God will live forever, right? When somebody dies, inheritance works that when you die, you get the stuff. But because God cannot, will not ever die, you get access to the stuff. So you can begin to live in and experience your inheritance now. So why do we walk around down and out, talking poor, feeling dejected, worrying about what people think about us? What in the world? We are heirs of the creator of God. And joint heirs with Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life to save ours. If we, in the, in, watch this, if we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Now, this is the part we don't like. You're going to suffer because of the human condition. Now, you can even either suffer as somebody's broke, poor, disconnected, and suffering the wrath of God, or you could suffer as a child. Which one do you want? Child. All day, every day. Right? We go through things in life because of sin in the world. We experience death. The weather, the ups, the downs, it's hot, it's cold. All of that is a function of ultimately of sin. And so we deal with that while we're here. But we can begin, you see, death for us just becomes a portal into eternal life. Right? So we're not worried about death. And I think if we really understand it, when we really get there, in terms of what God wants us to understand, leaving here opens up heaven and eternal life and immediate connection and direct face-to-face -face relationship with God. And see, the better life is here, the more we kind of want to hold on. But I think because we don't understand how great life will be in the future. And so if we could just grasp it just a little bit, I mean, when you read in Revelation, they say they, the asphalt in heaven is the most precious metal on earth. The Bible says the streets are paved with gold. I'm assuming they use asphalt. I'm just using the analogy for you, right? And so the stuff that's valuable here, you walk on and, 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 and drive your whatever on in heaven. The most valuable thing. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And that's the family into which we are adopted. And so my, I hope this will hit you maybe later this week. That if our mindsets change to understand who we are, it will change everything. You know, people talking about you, you're like, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the prince. <laughs> my father created the world. Peon, I don't care what you say about me. Isn't that true? Do you really think that king, queen, princes, all that are worried about what you, what you say about them? I don't even hear what you say about me. 
You don't have access to me. Right? You can't get in my mind. Because in the grand scheme, unless you need to become a follower of Jesus Christ, which I hope you do, that would be my aspiration for you. But what you say adversely about me doesn't matter. Because I'm royalty. Amen? Amen. And so some of us were called to, to teach, to preach, to speak, to lead, to run a business, to, 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 to be in front of people. And, and why, do we, why do we care? We're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And particularly if it's your kingdom assignment. But see, our enslaver is whispering to us. Who are you to be promoted? Who are you to, 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 to build a business? Who are you to teach, preach, speak? Who are you? And our answer should be like, I'm royalty. Who are you, ex-angel? Man, we're adopted as God's children. Number five, God is for us, with us, and he loves us. When we are led by the Spirit and our mind awakens, we realize that God is for us, he's with us, and he loves us. Romans 8 and 28. For we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, if you are saved, God has a purpose for your life. And then the scripture is saying to us, in everything. everything. It's not saying that everything is good. But he's saying in everything, God is orchestrating, I like this word, orchestrating things for our good. You see what I'm saying? So God is moving the pieces. Three, four moves, ten moves up the game. See, because God sees into eternity, what we're going through now, and it upsets us, and it worries us, and it bothers us, and we're all shook up. But the things that God sees, he's like, okay, fine, that was a bad thing, but guess what? I'm going to use it for the good. And again, for us, the worst, the worst thing is we die. That's the worst thing? I go to heaven and spend eternity? I see my mama, grandmama, and all that. My mama's right here. But I see my grandmama. I see my granddaddy. I see my dad. I see all those family members, those ones that we worried about. I see, most importantly, Jesus. I ask Adam, what were you thinking about? Yo, Grandpa, what were we doing, bro? You know you mess some stuff up, right? <laughs> you know those questions that you have about the Bible? What did that mean? I don't know. To be able to resolve, oh, you may not even care. I don't know. But the point is God is working. All of the craziness that happens in our life, he works it out. He orchestrates it for our ultimate good. I mean, you just hang on this one verse. It allows you to go through stuff. Like, okay, God, I don't see it. I don't understand it. I certainly don't like it. But God, you're working this for my good, so I trust you. And is anybody you've been through and you get on the other side, you're like, whoa, that's good. Okay, God, I see you. Okay. You know, it's like with your kids. You're, you're already thinking about their future. Isn't that right? Some of you got little ones, you, put, you got a 529 program already set up, so when it's time to go to college, they're already taken care of. Right? You're planning for the back to school clothes already. And, 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 the, and the more they are obedient to your instruction and direction, the more you want to do for them. Isn't that true? Amen. When them kids are good, you'd be like, hey, let me go out here and do something for this kid. Unconditionally. And so just if we, if in our little minute, our thinking, our mind, if we think like that, that came from God. What does God, he says, listen, eyes haven't seen. Ears haven't heard. What's the rest of the verse? Yeah. Or it's just what God has prepared. God is thinking about us. Preparing, planning for us. We're called according to his purpose. 831, what shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Me and God versus everybody. Me and God versus the world. If God is on your squad, who can be against you? Are you kidding me? 
You know what I mean? It's like you, you, you playing pickup and you got that 6'8 friend who was a pro basketball player. And you're like, oh, I'll, be, I'll be right there. I got next. And they're like, oh, really? Like, yep. You, you ever, you ever ch- stack, you get, you stack your team? Right? You'll be a scrub. Talk to, I am the trash talker. Right? You want me on your team if you're good. I ain't going to do nothing. Unless it's volleyball. I'm a beast. But listen, I, I, if you bring God to the game, You see what I'm saying? Cynthia's um, cousin was a bouncer. And there was a guy, he, big dude, strong. He, he was uh, at his funeral. He was talking about how these guys were trying to steal his car. He said, and then all of a sudden, they start apologizing and backing up. And he said he didn't understand what was going on. But then he looked behind him. And her cousin was there. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, bro. We was just playing. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because when you're like, oh. And so when you bring God with you into the place, would you really be afraid when you bring God with you? So when you step up in the place, step in the club. When you step up in the place, wherever it is, if you're bringing God with you, what are you worried about? Right? But Brother Cecil came in, he shared the testimony about going in Home Depot. <laughs> right? Buying hundreds of dollars worth of tile. He shared this one to me now. He started telling this. I heard he did it on Wednesday. He told me the other day. Right? Hundreds of dollars worth of tile. But God had told him to go to Home Depot. Now, if you don't believe God, you don't believe God tell you to go to Home Depot, God tell you to do stuff. Told him to go to Depot, Home Depot, $100 worth of tile for his house. They're like, all right, we'll give you a discount. There was a woman in the place that wanted the stuff. But Cecil was like, Whew. and you know how Karen or Mary, whatever her name was, you know, they get to acting out, that's my stuff. And you know, you know, for me anyway, the devil be like, sorry, sis. You see what I'm saying? Just being evil, that's not right. That's not right. I mean, the same pass y'all give yourself. God's not through with me yet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But the Holy Spirit be like, come on, let that go. He, he let her have the stuff. They call the thing, boom, boom. He gets it done. They tell him, go out to here and get it. He gets the hundreds of dollars worth of stuff for $12. Praise God. Imagine if he would have, A, ignored the Spirit, stayed home. He ignored the Spirit and told Mary, with Susie, whatever name, I'm keeping it. But because of his obedience... God is like, let me see what you're going to do, son. Wow. He gets all the time he needs for $12. Praise God. You see what I'm saying? But that's when you bring God with you. And when you are led by the Spirit. The Spirit has stuff. You can't even imagine. Things you haven't even fathomed yet. He's already working it out. He already had the $12 price tag. Now the question is, who are you going to mess it up? See what I'm saying? God already has in his mind what he's going to do. He knows. He set it up for you. And now it's just wait and see. Will you be obedient? Will you position yourself to receive the blessing that I already have for you? Are you going to rush and marry the joker? The God said that's not the one. Are you going to just go go, go, uh, uh, take that job because they're offering you so much money? Because they're, they're giving me more money than your current job. That must be the Lord. Not necessarily. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Right? The decision that you're wrestling with, that the Spirit has already answered and told you, but you don't like the answer, so you're like, well, but see, God, you don't understand. And we can find, you ever got yourself like a one-minute decision, get you into a multi-year mess? Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you make that, that decision, and the Spirit's like, don't do that. Don't do that. You don't want to do that. He's like, but God, see, you don't understand. You make that decision, and then now years later, you know what I'm saying? Credit still jacked up. You still got a limp. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> there's stuff, I mean, there's some dumb stuff we can do that will, I mean, in the consequence, 
may be with us for life. Heart broken for years. God's with us. He's for us and he loves us. Romans chapter 8. Land in the plain. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It says more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Over the top. I ain't just beat you. I destroyed you. You know what I mean? It's like 56 to nothing. Baseball. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That's a more than conqueror. Nine goes into 56 how many times? Nine times six, nine times six is 54. You know what I'm saying? All right, so nine times 54. Like every, in, just not, we just nine home runs every inning just destroy you more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 34, I am convinced. He says, and let me just spell the whole thing out just in case you wonder. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, right? That stuff here, angels or demons, Stuff that's happening now or the future, nor any powers, height, depth, anything, everything. I'm, I, did I cover it all for you? Nothing shall be able to separate you from the love of God that is in King, Savior, Master. Nothing. Do you see the promise? Do you, I don't know, man. If do we this this message, if we really buy it, our lives will be forever changed. Amen. Nothing can separate. Nothing can separate. Listen, God is for you. He's with you. And most importantly, God loves you. Amen. And so I hope that over the course of the week you review the scriptures, you reread this stuff. Let it sink in. We're not just reading to be reading, memorizing to be memorizing. The point is we want to be changed. We're training for reigning. We're being equipped to be who God created and designed us to be. And if we were to live and walk in this life that God has designed for us, we would be the most magnetic people in the world. People are like, I want to be like you. You can tell people who are loved. Children who are loved. Boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses who are loved. They just got a different swag. You know what I'm saying? Snaggle tooth joker come up to you, talk about girl, you cute. You're like, boy, go ahead. Get you some dinner work. You know what I'm saying? But folks who are not loved, they're like, hee hee hee. That's so cute. No, it's not nonsense. Get out of here. Beat it. When you're loved. You see what I'm saying? When, you, when your children love, you don't have to worry about them bringing home no knuckleheads because they know what love looks like. Amen. They understand love is not you put your hands on me. Love is not you screaming, hollering, act a fool with me. Amen. Love is what you do for me. Amen. Love is how you show, you demonstrate that you love me. Amen. Children whose parents love them. I mean, it's crazy. Even, even animals, dogs, right? My wife be wiping the dog's eyes, all the dog's ears. Ears don't, dog don't budge, don't run. Dog be like, go ahead, girl. <laughs> I'm like, what? You see a few dogs flinching and they all bow down. You know what I'm saying? My dog is royalty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's crazy. No, see, y'all laugh. The Bible says, listen, it says the people of God even care for their animals. That's what it says in Proverbs. Everything connected, affiliated, related to us should be different. Anyway, God is with me. He's for me. He loves me. I hope y'all get it too. Amen. God bless you. Amen. All right. So <laughs> maybe somebody got that today. And maybe somebody got it maybe for the first time. The Bible tells us we read this week. We're going to practice. We, we went through Romans. We could tell. We can now witness. We're equipped. Romans 3 and 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6 and 23 says what? The wages, the earnings, the payment of sin is death. Romans 5 and 8 said, but what? But while we were yet sinners, Christ 
die. Then Romans chapter 10, this week, verse 9. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is my boss, my CEO, my owner, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, what? We shall be saved. I think it's maybe 513, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so today, I invite you, if you don't yet know him, to call on the name of the Lord. So if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, you're my boss. You run the show. You're the Lord. I surrender my life to you. And you believe that God raised him from the dead. He's like, that's, that's the tough part. It's like you believe that Christ died, and in his dying, he paid the price for your sins. And God then resurrected him. And it's in the resurrection that death, hell, the grave were defeated. And so that is why they have no power over you. He says, so if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be, you will be. You have the opportunity to be saved. So I invite you today, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, to make him your king. And for those of us who were there, I want us to understand more deeply the implications of being the children of God. To realize how we should walk in power and authority. How our proclivity to sin, our interest in sin, our desire to sin should be being reduced as we mature and grow and we understand who God is. Sin should become more and more distasteful to us. And so wherever you are in the continuum of not saved, but I want to do that today, to I'm saved, but I need to grow, continue to be more like him. Wherever we are, and we're all on a journey. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to study it, to understand it a little bit, and to be able to Share it with my brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. Lord God, I, I, I pray that the word will sink in deeply. Lord God, as we review and we, we, we go on the app or wherever we review this message. Lord God, let those words jump off the page like they did for me this week. Open up our minds and our understandings to be able to comprehend just a little bit. How wide and how deep. How high your love for us. Help us to begin to fathom just a little bit the magnitude of the love that you have for us. And so, Father, I thank you. I praise you. I bless you. God, for that one that doesn't know you today, I join them in prayer, acknowledging that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. Understanding that the wages of sin is death. But realize that because of your great love for me, you paid the price and I am now righteous. I'm justified, acquitted of the sins that I committed, the wages that I earned. And because you love me so much, you sent your son to die to pay the price for my sin. And so today I confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And so I can declare that I am saved. And God, for those of us who are saved, and we know we're saved, well, God, help us to realize that we're adopted, we're loved. You knew all of our faults and our failures, and you still wanted us to be your children. Well, God, we're no longer enslaved to sin. The Holy Spirit has broken the chains of sin that bound us. The enemy no longer has right to guide us, to lead us, to drag us around as his slaves. We were completely free and we are empowered and we realize and we walk in our royalty. We walk in our dignity. We walk in the overfunding, overflowing abundance of your love. And so help us, God, to realize who we are and to carry ourselves accordingly, that we can experience the abundant life that you designed us to experience. And then, Lord God, that we can share that good news of the gospel of the kingdom with others who are far from you, our family members, our friends, our co-workers, our classmates. Anybody who needs to hear that they're loved. 
and that their life could be changed forever. And so, Father, I thank you for today. I, play, I praise you, I bless you, give you glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Bible says on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he convened his disciples. He brought them together. He says, I want to give you an experience to remember me by. We call that uh, communion. When we take a moment to reflect on what Jesus did on the cross for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died to pay the price for our sins. And so he said to the disciples, he said, listen, I'm about to be killed. But this is necessary because my death is going to position you to reconcile you back to the Father. And so Paul, when he's teaching about this, he says it's important that before we receive the communion that we examine ourselves. Look inwardly. Is there anything, any ongoing sin in our lives that we need to repent of? Is there any broken relationship that we need to repair? Is there anything that is not like God? that we're aware of, that we need to fix. He says, let a person examine themselves. Get that stuff straight so that when we can come and receive of what Jesus did for us without any guilt, without any shame, we can come boldly and celebrate what he did for us on the cross. So let's take a moment together to examine ourselves and see where we are, if we're positioned properly before the Lord, that we can come to the table. Father, in the name of Jesus. We just take this moment to examine ourselves. <clears throat> if there's anything that's not like you and us, Father, we ask that you forgive us. Remove it. Cleanse us. Purify us. Give us hearts that are pursuant of you. Oh God, remove the desire to sin. Make sin distasteful to us. And give us hearts that are yielded to you and desire to please you and to be who you've created to be, us to be, to behave like we're the royalty that you said we are. And so we come, oh God, the bread that represents your body that you allowed to be beaten and abused for us. And the blood Lord God, is represented by the juice, the blood that you shed on the cross to pay the price for our sins that we could not. For that, Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. And similarly, he took the cup. He said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Amen. God's blessing be on you. Have an amazing rest of your week. Tell the person on your left and your right, my pastor loves you. God bless you. Have an amazing week.